make it in the worst possible ways. And you've always done it. 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. Well, they accused Stephen of being against the word of God. They accuse Stephen of being against God. But they're the ones who are furious after hearing the simple word of God. Look who can't tolerate the word of God. It's them. You know, a person's reaction to a biblical message reveals their attitude towards God. Verse 55. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen, being persecuted and about to be murdered, is full of peace. Meanwhile, the religious rulers are full of rage. Stephen's circumstances obviously are worse than theirs, but he is feeling better than them because his focus is on Jesus. Circumstances do not have to dictate feelings, as we see. 57. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They were acting like a bunch of fools. They are filled with uncontrolled rage because they cannot take the truth. Verse 58, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul would not admit it at the time, but the words of Stephen sort of ate at his insides. Stephen's godly attitude under intense pressure would be one of the things anyway, I think, that the Holy Spirit used to begin to convince Saul that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Verse 59. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Religious rulers really would have been enraged if they would have known that killing Stephen was actually promoting Stephen. As it is, even after Stephen was dead, they were filled with hate and no doubt misery and more guilt than ever. They didn't solve their problem by killing Stephen. And you know what else? They, didn't, they did not eliminate the truth by killing Stephen either. They still have to live with reality and their sin and the rejection of God. Killing Stephen, who was just a mouthpiece for God, that's not going to change anything. 60. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. There's a class act and a godly act. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Stephen was also kind to those who were killing him. And that was the evidence that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I should say. Holiness, forgiveness, that's evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's go into chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Christian persecution spearheaded by Saul was sin, and it was misguided zeal. But that persecution was used by God to get Christians out of Jerusalem, get them spreading the message of salvation in other areas. 
And so, very important lesson for us. Sometimes God uses discomfort to get us to go in a different direction. Verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Now, if someone was executed after being found guilty in a fair trial, God forbid any mourning for that person. But the men mourned for Stephen, and they were called godly. That's because Stephen was not guilty, and he didn't receive a fair trial either. Verse 3, But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. He was ravaging, or he laid waste. The church describes what wild animals do to their prey, actually. If Saul wasn't demon-possessed, he sure acted like it. Acting like a wild fierce animal going after Christians. Verse 5. Philip went down to... Actually, let's read verse 4. Because it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Look at that. Persecution always backfires on the devil. And here it causes the word of God to spread even more. The Bible says, The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Philip is setting the stage for Peter to use his kingdom keys for the second time. Peter used those keys the first time when he preached the gospel to the Jews. The second time it will be to the Samaritans. Verse 6. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. Philip did miracles to authenticate his ministry. Of course, now that we have the complete scriptures, a preacher's credentials, there's no longer miracles. The norm for credentials today is correct doctrine. Second John verses 8 through 11. Does what he preach line up with Scripture? If it does, he's got all the credentials that he needs. 7. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Church was growing fast. And you know what? It was really cool to be a Christian. But of course, whenever that happens, it means some who claim to be Christian have not really repented and have not really made a commitment to Christ. Look at verse 9. We'll see one. Verse 9 says, But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. Simon had a lot of people fooled because he evidently had supernatural powers. He had people believing that he was a channel of divine power and revelation. Verse 10. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. And so the people were spellbound by Simon's power. You know, when people do not understand the scriptures, they can easily be fooled into thinking that something is of God simply because it displays supernatural power. Nothing no matter how supernatural it is, is from God if it is contrary to Scripture. In fact, it is a test from God to see if we will believe Him over the supernatural. And uh, this is a good place to stop. 
We'll pick it up in verse 12 next time. Until then, so long everyone.